Hi everybody, I'm Michael Goodman with Artmatcher, the mobile app connecting art lovers, artists, galleries, art fairs, and art events. While we continue to build a great experience, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today and check out Art Matcher in the Apple App Store and Google Play. Welcome to another Art Matcher, the podcast. Joining us in the studio today, a special guest and friend, Linda Jacobson. Linda, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I live in Venice, uh, California, Venice Beach, and I'm a painter. I've been a painter for many years. I won't go into how long, but a long time. And um, I went to uh, school here in Los Angeles. I went to uh, Otis and Art Center and Cal State Northridge and met a lot of Actually, it was the early days of Los Angeles art, the art scene when there was not much happening and it was very exciting. I actually was an art writer in those early days and an artist as well. So it was really fun. Um, there was a lot of energy, even though it was a very small community. And we had some big name artists that lived here. Uh, my teacher, my mentor, Lurzer Feidelson, was one of the first uh, artists to come from New York, to come to L.A. He started the L.A. Art Association. He taught at Art Center. And he was really one of the major names here early in L.A. Uh, and the other person I studied with, Hans Burkhardt, was also a well-known uh, artist, nationally known artist, abstract expressionist. So I, I always felt, felt very fortunate to have a very good education. And I would say my education was just knowing these artists. And uh, Lorzer's wife was Helen Lundeberg. And uh, she was also, in a way, my mentor, just by being a role model of a woman artist who was really uh, independent and really uh, focused on her work and was taken seriously at the time and was a wonderful painter. And all of this was on here on the West Coast? It was all on the West Coast in Los Angeles. What was the the tone then up until then? Was it just like New York was where you were to be an artist? Absolutely. It was, if you want to be an artist, you need to go to New York. And a lot of the um, people that I went to school with that actually Cal State and Northridge, they went to Irvine and they... Irvine was amazing because they had people like Barbara Rose and Frank Stella teaching there, and they all went to New York. They felt you needed to go to New York if you were going to be a serious artist. I tried, but New York was just not my Wait, vibe. You, did, were you out in New York? I Well, um, one of my friends, Jack Barth, who was a wonderful artist, invited me to come and stay with him in New York for a while, and... I just knew, I mean, I, it was very exciting, but I just knew that New York was not the place for me to thrive as a person, you know, and um, because LA was so new and open, you just felt there was a feeling of freedom. You you didn't have to like fit into certain things. You could have a sense of freedom and we're, at, we're actually kind of creating uh, kind of a new LA art form. What was that landscape? So as, as everything is new, exciting, were there like clicks? Did you feel like you had to identify with a group oh. of people? Like were there groups where you're like, oh, wow, there, oh. there's this group of people. I, I need to hang out with these cool people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Talk about clicks. I mean, it was like, it was um, cutthroat clicks. It was like the were gangs of the New York. No, it was... <laughs> Which, okay. which one were you in? Well, I was in the painter's school. So we had in the, um, now I'm not sure about the years, I think it was in the 70s was the time of conceptual art where painting was dead. That was whatever, you know, they all said painting is dead. So you'd have people like Barry LeVay, who was getting his master's at Otis at the time I started school there, that would, it was about randomness. So we'd throw little felt dots up on the 
on the floor and wherever they landed. And then that was the installation. And I thought that was like super cool. But I always loved drawing and painting. I mean, that's what really excited me and why I became an artist. So I could not really get behind the conceptual art. And there were feuds, really feuds going on between uh, that. And of course, there was a time of femini feminism was really big. So you had the whole feminist art, uh, which I also, I mean, I was on the fringes of, but I was didn't really see myself as a feminist artist. I loved nature. I love landscape and the inner landscape. So it was always about, for me, it was about soul, um, landscape, and also the figure as well. Do you find yourself now kind of, kind of looking where that all started to looking at the art now? Do you look at some of your peers and go, wow, you know, I was there around when that was kind of starting before that mm -hmm. was like, cool. Cause like when I think about the first thing for some reason for me, and maybe this is because of my, uh, my studies, when I think about West coast artists, for some reason, like R Richard Diebenkorn, mm. like is the first one that comes in my head. Yeah. And I feel like there's these certain artists that are identified with the West coast. Were there any of them from that school that you were part of that are now like those mega, mega West coast stars? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. Like it wasn't Wayne, Wayne Tabot was from. Wayne Tabot. Well, they, okay. So a lot of the artists that you're thinking those of those were with the Bay area. And I loved the Bay area school. I really identified with that painterliness of Stephen Korn, Tebow, uh, David Park. Um, those guys were, um, Definitely West Coast artists, but they were uh, Northern California. So here we had the Hard Edge School, Lorzer Fidelson being one of them. Um, uh, oh gosh, I think of that other artist. I can't think of his name right now. But um, and then we had the the Light School. You know the the Venice artists, uh, Chuck Arnoldi, uh, Laddie Dill. Um, Billy L. Bangston. These were the Venice artists. And that was a, a Peter, uh, no, Altoon, John Altoon. So they were all the Venice artist school. And there was like a, kind of a generation before me. But they um, were, well, Bangston and Altoon were, and Craig Kaufman, Robert Irwin. So they were, and Dwayne Valentine. And, um, I knew Dwayne. Actually, <laughs> a little story that with uh, Billy Bankston, when I was about 19, I uh, went knocked on a studio door with my art that I had done in, <laughs> in my painting class. And I, I, he was a friend of a friend. So I knocked on his door and I said, um, I came here to show you my paintings. I would love to get a critique from you. Wow. So I know. So he was really nice, you know, and he came out and he said, well, I don't really know what to say because it was figurative painting. You know, he was, he was an abstract painter. Oh, wow. So, um, but um, oh, Ed Moses is another artist. So of that group, Ed Moses became Oh, yeah. No, I saw well known. they, they uh, in recent years have really been pushing a lot of. Uh, yeah. I don't, you know, he passed away. Does he have away. a son named Andy? Andy. Yeah. And um, yeah, Andy's his son. And he's a painter as well. He's a painter as well. Wow. Yeah. Ed was uh, really instrumental and uh, influenced a lot of, of abstract painters in Los Angeles. So he was an L.A. painter. Yeah. <clears throat> so the light school was about the light of um, kind of the Santa Monica Beach area, like Deep and Corn painted the Ocean Park series, which has to do with the light. Oh, that's so, so that exciting. Was, yeah. Earlier today we were with um, Molly Barnes. Was did was she coming up in the scene as a as a dealer? Like how how did she you was already there. So Molly Molly was uh I think her gallery, she opened her gallery in the early sixties. So be before I was really go, you know, old enough or whatever to go to gallery, she had a gallery on La Cienega, the Molly Barnes Gallery. And um, she was always very generous. I remember going to her and asking her for help, like where to you know, take my work. And she was very generous in helping. She would help artists. At that last show um, that I was there, 
there was a young couple mm-hmm. must have been 18, 19 years old. And uh, one of the artists uh, was asking her, what's a good way to get started? Uh-huh. And Molly said, I'll meet with you on Wednesday and today's Wednesday. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Yeah, no, it's 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 amazing that she's yeah. just uh, someone who's yeah. Let's let's do it. Let's make it happen. That's so so. She's always been that way, huh? She's always been that way. Really helpful. She's very. She had a very interesting background. She's from New York, and she knew um, de Kooning very well, and uh, the Joan Mitchell. She's friends with Joan Mitchell, and a lot of the uh, artists in New York School, abstract expressionist painters. And there was no, well, I guess there was, you, you said New York wasn't kind of your vibe to be there uh, it was personally. Ex- yeah, it was exciting. Um, I remember with my friend uh, Jack, we met um, the artist, uh, I can't think of his name, but like oh, we went to... Um, Julian Schnabel gave a, gave a oh, lecture. Wow. So, and feeling guilty, he goes, I'm so sorry I'm successful. <laughs> that was that, his lecture. That, that is kind of wild to think about. Like, so who are those artists that you're like, wow, these are, these were the rock stars. Julian Schnabel was a total rock star. And it's interesting because I look at his work. I, I oh, so I met um, the director of the Museum of Modern Art and we went through the museum together. We were looking at, he said, Julian Schnabel as a painter is not up to the standard of Richard Diebenkorn and Matisse. And he said, you'll see. And uh, I think that's true. I think he's an amazing director. Yeah, he's a phenomenal. Phenomenal uh, director. That really is his um, his art form. His, but his, um, um, he, his plate paintings, I think, and this is one of the things that from my art dealing, I, I realized that I think every artist needs an aesthetic kind of voice. Something like Keith Haring had his mm-hmm. kind of lines. Warhol had his process, which was essentially silk screening mm-hmm. most of his work. Did you, did you feel that there was a, like, well, how, how, how were artists then going about it? I mean, that's me kind of interpreting it now as a viewer and as someone who kind of. Okay. I think that's a really good question because it was, the thing was, was finding your voice, your, your, your thing. And it could be something that was really authentic or could be like a gimmick. Okay, so who were the gimmicks of the day? Well, uh, okay. Would that be considered like Leroy Neiman, Peter Max? Or? Um, like where were they? Because there's all these. No, the ones that were like, I mean, like putting uh, like putting ta- tax on the wall, like sticking tax in the wall, you know, and like push oh, pins well, in the wall. we still have that. <laughs> we still have that. But I mean, you don't know the names of those people that were putting push pins in the wall, you know. Wow. Um. And there were, you know, just, I mean, you were just really, really trying. I mean, I, I would say that I'm probably guilty of like trying to, you know, like using gimmicks as well. Cause like, it's like, oh gosh, how am I going to be like really different? You know? And the thing is you're really different because that's what comes out of you from your soul, from your mind, from your, you know, your personal relationship to the world it's not like sitting down and going well i think i'll do this gimmick because it'll make me you know be an art star well so i mean i'm assuming for you that that process of kind of the gimmick has fled it didn't well i realized i couldn't do it you know i could i realized that i could only do what was authentically myself and that has been really very true about me. I cannot, and I've never been able to do anything else except what's authentic to myself. It's maybe a little, you know, I don't know, autistic. I'm not sure, but I can only do that. I think it's tough for artists because I think there's a part where you're trying to figure out what's going to work. And then eventually if something does work and people respond to it, especially collectors, then that's kind of what you have to do at least. And and it's Mm -hmm. interesting when we're touring through Molly's collection or her home. Um, how uh, there was that artist, uh, uh, Kus- Kusabi. Oh, Mark Kusabi. Mm-hmm. And, and it's it's interesting. My, I don't know much about his work other than I could recognize his work. Mm-hmm. 
um, but I haven't followed his career, but Molly was instrumental, I guess, in Mm -hmm. starting it. And yes, but he also was incredibly, um, I don't know what, I don't want to say a negative word, but he was like really had a strong vision about ego about what he wanted to create in the world for himself. And I think that was really what fueled his success as well as Molly, because he went to New York and he became a very big name. Wow. Yeah, he really, he really did. He real and he's a really good painter, but he also had that vision for himself of what he, he wanted, wanted. Something much more. He wanted something much more. And like I say, in those times, you needed to go to New York to really get your name happening. So we're like, so this is the interesting thing that I'm kind of like battled because you have like this golden era of so many artists. I mean, some pass away. Like where do the, where do, where where do the, the voices of Basquiat, Keith Haring, like while you're making work is, are the people you're associated, are they paying attention to that? Or like, was that part of the conversation because you see, because the, the mega Titan galleries that are still around, mm-hmm. their stars were those people, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and their artists like uh, Ross Blechner. That was actually the artist that I met in New York that I really, really like his work a lot. Ross Blechner is a really good painter. Um, so... I don't know how to answer that. I think that... Because I'm wondering, like, was the goal... Because today when artists come out of art school, I mean, today with social media, we understand that things aren't what they seem. And Mm -hmm. pre these social media days, it must have even been harder to, like, showcase your work because today you you could just... Yeah, you do it yourself. You could do it yourself, the barrier of entry. There's still a lot of fish in the sea, but at least you can uh, take more of an initiative. Mm -hmm. I would assume that most students at art school thought, like, the only way I make money, like, as a painter, is is getting a gallery. Well, that's a good question, and that's really interesting because it was basically a gallery-run system. You... For the artist, there was no other way than to have a gallery represent and showcase you. And um, that was, you know, that was the way it was done. And um, galleries had all the power in, in their hands, you know, for the artist. And so it was difficult for artists. They were really dependent on that. And it's changed so much now. You know, did, did the museums play a big role back then? And the museums too. They had like the, the they had, I think it was LACMA had a Young Talent Award or MOCA, I can't remember. I think MOCA had a Young Talent Award where they'd showcase like maybe 10 artists a year that got the Young Talent Award. And that would help them, you know, find a gallery to, um, you know, get their careers off the ground. Was there a favorite gallery when you were coming up in the scene that you, that you were like? Uh, Let's see. Oh, favorite gallery. Um, Well, I remember, I mean, just, of course, I used to love to go to the Museum LACMA. That was really great to go there. And they always had really interesting shows. Um, then La Cienega was where Molly's gallery was. That's where most of the galleries were. And just on that one block or two blocks on La Cienega. There's still like a There's couple still a of remnants. couple yeah. remnants, but there was Ferris Gallery. And there was, um, let's see, um, can't remember. Oh, uh, Irving Blum Gallery. That was a favorite of mine. And Irving Blum was really, really nice. Uh, and I remember meeting Andy Warhol there. No, wow. no, I'm sorry, David Hockney, not Andy Warhol, David, David Hockney. Well, another massive one. Yeah, and he was really friendly and nice, David Hockney. So that was, I, I was, I was a, an art student then, so probably in my mid-20s. And that was really cool. And I always liked the shows at Irving Blum. He, had, he showed mainly New York artists. And I'm wondering how the scene like has differed if, if, if there's something like 
Was there a time where you just dropped off the, cause I think when people are getting into the scene, you're like going to a lot of galleries, going to a lot of openings, yeah. drinking a lot of wine, yeah. meeting people. I know personally I've kind of dialed dial down. <laughs> well, it's tough when you're, when you're running uh, the challenge, when you're, when you're dealing and you're doing that, you're so focused on your own program that yeah. you don't really have time. I recently went to honor Frazier. Oh, they yeah. had a show for Kenny Scharf and I was like, wow, you know, like he was making art. That, I mean, he, you know, he, yeah, I he was I, showing in New York. Kenny Scharf, I don't think was showing in LA. He was showing in New York, uh, at that, uh, Tony Shafrazi gallery. Wow. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, I think that I love going to galleries, but there was only like, you know, there weren't, I mean, there's so many more galleries now. There was just like a handful of galleries on La Cienega. And then, uh, you know, like we'd have, I actually, op we opened up a co-op gallery. So that we called it the Seven Street Gallery. And that was in, I think that was in the late seventies. And it was with my teachers at Art Center, maybe mid seventies, my teachers at Art Center and some of the students, and there were maybe like seven of us or so. And so that was an attempt, you know, to do like a co-op artist gallery. And it was really fun. And um, we had, I had a lot of shows there. It was really, we had group shows, solo shows. It was uh, near Otis College. It was downtown. Did you think that you would be when you were a student, you would ever teach at o Otis? Because I know you do. No, I never thought I'd teach it. I was, it's really great. No, I never thought, because I was kind of a rebellious student. I like, it's kind of like. <laughs> Ditching class. Well, getting in fights with teachers and stuff, being, you know, I, uh, it's a different person. I, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on, on art school, because, uh. I know uh, a lot of that's a pitchfork for a lot of people on the road. It is. Well, f number one, art school was not as expensive as it is now. I mean, I just, I mean, I teach at Otis now and I, I, uh, it's so expensive. I mean, it's 200,000 or something to, that's, that's, to get your degree. I mean, degree. I think about that and I think about like, if an artist were to put that in their practice, would mm. they be better off? You know, I think for an artist finding a mentor, someone that encourages them, understands them, that is what's, there's two things that art schools are good for. It's finding the mentor, finding a teacher that is a hit and miss, right? If you find that person that really understands you, that inspires you, um, and connecting with other artists is really important. And I think, you know, the friends that one makes in art school, like my friends that I made in art school, I stayed friends with for years, years and years. And they were, you know, they, they were my community. I think artists do need to be in community with other artists. Even if you, you know, your work is different, I still think you need to have that dialogue. And I think that's what art school is good for, you know? Yeah, I remember having critiques and, and, and kind of having that v that feedback was kind of instrumental to like mm -hmm. pushing. Mm -hmm. But what I find uh, with a lot of artists now is after they complete their MFA program, they, they don't do an, they don't do art. And it was the same thing when I went to school. After people got their degrees, um, very few. I mean, they would say, oh, "Okay, maybe like ten percent of you are still going to be painting after five years," wow. and maybe. I don't know, 1% after, you know, a long time. I mean, it's hard to stay with it because as you know, um, selling work is hit and miss and um, you have to be really called to be an artist. You really have to feel it in your soul that you can't be anything else. And I sometimes I think, wow, you know, if I had been like done something else, like a psychologist or something, I would like, you know, have a nice, well, I'm lucky that I have a nice house, but you know, 
I'd be in a different financial situation, but there's just no way I could have lived any other life than by being an artist. And I think that's what artists have to feel. You know, they used to say, unless you really have to do it, don't go into <laughs> being an artist. And there is some truth to that, you know, and I mean, it doesn't mean you can't make art. I mean, I work with a lot of people that really enjoy painting and yeah, you have a lot of students. I have a lot of students, and you know how many of them are are you know serious artists? It's different. It's to be a serious artist is another. Uh, it's another level. Do you find some of your students they they take o- they uh, take after your style? None of them do. Really? No, I ne- I totally discourage them taking after. Uh, there was one. She got ended up getting mad at me. <laughs> I really discourage them taking after my style. I don't want, I want them, one of the big things as a teacher is that I want to help them find their, their voice, whatever, if it's like totally different than mine, it's fine. Maybe not conceptual art. Cause I can't really, I can't, I don't have the tools to teach that. It's, I'm not that kind of a, an artist, but. Um, but you, you can look at art conceptually. Sure. And so what fascinates me, and I think I only learned this through the higher education of art, meaning there's artists who take on art as a hobby and I can't have the conversation of like, do you know what it means to be a painter? Meaning understanding that there's been painters that that have come before you that have laid paint to canvas. And we're talking about that the context of art and then you know that you lose them you're like okay they're not okay I'm so glad you asked this question because that's like we're on mind meld right now because (laughs) it's so important to know about the history of art and I actually teach an art history class and in my classes I show artists that I really like um that I you know artists you know from the past whether it's like you know 10 years or uh, you know, 200 or, years yeah, could, you could take or it. Egyptian, you know, because <clears throat> looking at what artists did in the, it's a thread. Art is a thread. Art comes from art. So you need to have that education of art and whether you, and I don't know if they're teaching it in art school. I wonder maybe in Europe, you like in. There's certain academies that I think are more on it, but it really depends if you, I, I would, I learned it because I was, I was studying painting. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming if I wasn't studying that, I probably wouldn't have been exposed to what I was, or it could have been just, I took the wrong class and it wasn't there. But Mm -hmm. I've also, I've also, as an artist, I think like that, meaning I'm not the first one to embark on this journey. And so when I look at a canvas, I, I really have that in the back of my mind because there's, there's art. And we, we've, we've spoke about this, I think, like when I talk to you about your process, how your process is uh, more free form and kind of what comes, but all that knowledge is still there mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. somewhere either in the subconscious or mm-hmm. even conscious, like mm-hmm. you could consciously like, oh, you know, that came uh, from somewhere. Like when I mm-hmm. look at, when I look at Cezanne and then I look at like Picasso's cubism for instance i could say well i could see where something was influenced Mm -hmm. one from another yeah i mean i think oh yeah i mean to see how picasso was influenced by by, Cezanne. oh yeah yeah, he also uh Cezanne also influenced matisse and paul clay and um so many artists and that's just like the the basic level of it Mm -hmm. when i think about it in terms of how you can go, you could go really deep down and, and down the rabbit hole. Yeah. I mean, I, I say to my students that art comes from art and I show them like in the, I teach the history of art. I show how art is a thread, how like the Renaissance was fueled by the Greek classic period and how Picasso took from the Renaissance, the structure and, um, than how Cezanne did and how Matisse took from Cezanne. I mean, it is remarkable how they took from it, they learned from it, and they did it in their own way. So, you know, if there's a, if you can go to art school that's going to help you teach, learn this kind of stuff, it's worth it. If they're going to, like, give, just let you go freeform, and you need to get a good education. 
I think that's important. I really do. But it doesn't necessarily have to be in an art school. So that, that, that gets into kind of an interesting area of artists that how important is technical training then? Because you have artists that their journey is not necessarily formal. Right. Where they're kind of trying to explore a feel. Yeah. And so... Well, the only thing with that, Michael, is if you don't have the technical know-how, you're just limited. It doesn't mean you can't be an artist. It means you can... You you're know, just limited of what you can express. Yeah, you're limited in the way you can express. Let's say you've never learned how to draw. Well, if you really, you know, have that kind of uh, mind where you can go, oh, I need to learn how to draw. I'm going to go draw for this new series I'm working on. But if you could also go, well, I don't know how to draw, so I'm going to, I just stick, you know, it limits you. In your teaching, are you teaching your students techniques then? Not any, not since I'm online. It's like I've tried to teach uh, online uh, painting classes and it's pretty much impossible. But I was teaching techniques, a way of painting. And I used to teach drawing. I'm not teaching drawing now, but I taught like basic figure drawing and um, usually taught with acrylics, how to use acrylics and, you know, different techniques, how to like... Because I, I, th like I think something that has helped me and, and what a lot of artists don't realize about my, uh, my education is that I know how to paint. So mm -hmm. when I'm talking to an artist about his work, for instance, I know when an artist is working from like a white canvas. Oh, rather than putting a tone and down. Than putting a tone. And I think about somewhere along the line, one of my professors Said. taught me that. And it was <laughs> right. like... At the time, I thought like, ah, oh. because when you're, I was, this was in high school, I was going to an arts high school. It was like, oh, that's another thing I have to do. That's going to like, I thought it was just extra time. I didn't realize down the line how actually, yeah, uh, how effective that is. That it actually makes it easier if you take the time to not skip that step. Or yeah, I learned about, there was projects where we did a grid exercise where you're just kind of trying to mimic a photo, photo realistic. But this school was like an academy. It was mm -hmm. like they wanted to know you have the skills. I mean, and like, like I had photography, I had, I had uh, ceramics, mm -hmm. like you need to have, how to throw and spin clay. Even, mm -hmm. even though I was a painting major. I, I think I did. That. I but, made the most silly looking ceramics, but I did it. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and it, it's interesting because when you get to the, I think, college or university level, uh, I'm not sure if all of that, I mean, I'm sure they're, they're there, but for me, I, I had a foundation across the board in a in an art school. So well, that's very rare that you had a high, to have a high school education like that is a really fantastic thing. I mean, I think I had maybe two or three art classes all th in high school, nothing. Yeah. This was a different art class every day, four that's hours fabulous. a day. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, well, uh, I, I went to, I think, um, Otis, it was the first school I went to, and we had, in your foundation, you had to do sculpture, so I did, like, figure sculpture out of clay, and then we did ceramics and um, painting and drawing. And then um, when I went to Art Center, it was just more, it was just really drawing and painting, you know, really structured drawing. Like, I like Art Center's program. They yeah, they... That. It's really Crank out so good we, artists. Yeah, and then we learned how to draw like in the Renaissance style. So I mean, it was really we learned Renaissance composition, and that's where I met Larser. And um, you know, he really taught us about say what Cezanne was doing and the Futurists and Kandinsky, and um, so it was. I feel blessed that I had this education, but it came from a person that was a really an artist and. I don't think he went to, really went to art school. He lived in New York and Paris. The other thing that I was lucky to do is when I was in my, I guess, late 20s, um, my 
boyfriend at the time was an art, well, fairly well-known artist, and we traveled all through Europe, and I met um, these, like Lucien Clerc, who was Picasso's photographer, and um, Patrick Kramer, who had a gallery in Geneva of, that showed Picasso's work, and people, uh, artists from the Cobra School, and like going to the museums in Europe, and the, I mean, it was just fantastic. I have a, uh, an interesting question. When is an artist ready to show uh, their work from a, kind of an educator's perspective? You know, I think if you feel you're ready, if you feel it and you have a body of work, I would say you have 20 good paintings. I think you're ready to show. Because for me, it's it's interesting. I've been going around, looking at different galleries. A lot of galleries are poaching from these MFA programs, mm -hmm. painting specifically, I'll just say Yale Fine Art. And, <laughs> and I could tell the difference between graduate work and art and kind of more, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's this, I don't know what it is, but I feel there's this institutional uh, output mm -hmm. of a certain type of art. It does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It looks like graduate work. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> it's uh, academia is a business too, you know, and I think uh, they're trying to, they have a certain mindset of the time that's, and unfortunately that mindset in five years could be very, very different. So that's why um, artists have to be trained in different ways so they can, you know, maneuver and, maneuver and find their own voice. I mean, that's to me the most important thing. And the artists that you, that I like are artists that have skill and have their own voice. Cause I think about every year new artists enter like mm -hmm. today, even today, uh, when we were going around Molly, I, I didn't know a lot of the artists that she was mm -hmm. mentioning. And part of it is just due to, I mean, I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't around. <laughs> you weren't even but, born yet. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how relevant are those artists today? It's, it's. Well. And how do you feel like, do you feel that they're, there's a lot of artists that are being forgotten right now. You know, artists will be forgotten and then they'll be remembered. You know, I think it kind of goes like that. There's a trend. So there could be, uh, I'm trying to think, I think like, for instance, maybe right now, Ed Moses, he had a kind of, he's been gone for a few years now and he's kind of like that buzz about him has kind of fallen up, but he'll come back, you know? And um, so I think there's, and I mean, ultimately, in a way that doesn't matter. I mean, that's the marketplace. I mean, if you have a painting that you love that speaks to you, that has meaning for you, that's really important. That's what I think. If you're a collector, for a new collector, that's what I would say to a new collector is um, if there's a painting that speaks to you, don't think about you know, like how much money you're going to make off of it, or is it going to be, is this artist going to be famous? But does this enhance your life? Do you connect to it? Does it do something for you? And I think that's what's meaningful. I guess what I'm getting at is like, when you were in the infancy of your career, there were people who were on, right? Mm -hmm. There were names. And yeah. then now you're at a point in your career, you could kind of look around and say, okay, their We're names still? are gone. I mean, they're, they were like the <clears throat> most famous, like, oh man, their names were like, you know, neon kind of, and don't even hear about them anymore. Wow. That's, it's very interesting. Cause like, I, I think we're, we're coming on a point where I love Monet. I love Monet. I love all that stuff, but it's like, you're not going to hear about it too much. I mean, we'll admire it from a museum standpoint, but mm -hmm. you're not going to see too many of those trading in public hand. I mean, there's not There aren't that many, many and to they're go so around. expensive. Probably. Well, eventually they they end up in a museum and then that's yeah. then you never, you know. Then they're in a museum. You kind of know about it. I don't think there's been like a massive conversion of like some of the recent 
as much as they are in museums like Basquiat's, Warhol's, those guys, there's still a lot of time to tell of mm -hmm. where they're going to be in the bigger conversation in history. Like it's hard to say. Three, four hundred years from now. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, probably Andy Warhol will be because he's so iconic of that time that we lived in. I mean, he really put his finger on the pulse of what was happening in the 60s. On that time, wow. On the time. And for that, I think he'll be um, remembered. It's hard to know about other people. I mean, for sure, Picasso will, no question about that. Um, it's hard to say that. I mean, when I think about how influential someone like Picasso is, is if you name your child Picasso, like, the first reference is going to be Pablo. Mm -hmm. Meaning, oh, like, you know, when <laughs> like references in culture, like when you see a kid who draws, like, oh, maybe it'll be a Picasso. Like right. that's a reference in culture. Yeah. Is that called a meme? Is that a meme? It, 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 it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's more than a meme. It's, it's, yeah. I remember, I mean, anyone that's the, he's like the artist they reference. Right. Or yeah, he's a Picasso yeah, they don't say, "Oh, he's going to be a Cezanne," or he's going to be a that. Warhol. It's going to be a war no. You don't want to, you don't necessarily want him to be a Warhol. No, but it's interesting they they reference Picasso. I can't believe we're almost closing up uh, closing time now, Linda. Where can uh, the audience uh, find you? Okay, uh, my website is lindajacobson.net. I'm on Instagram, Linda underscore Jacobson J A C O B S O N. Thank you guys so much. And until next time, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.